for protection against these covert mercenaries, many samurai castles and houses built nightingale floors, specially constructed to loudly squeak when trod upon, a high-tech security system designed to catch the ninja. With a decline in the warrior ethic came a decline in sword quality. Mass production resulted in many inferior blades. It was during this period of intense warfare that a new weapon arrived on the battlefield. A weapon that would end forever the dominance of the classical warrior. In 1542, a Chinese junk arrived on the shores of Japan. On board were three Portuguese who became the first Westerners to land on Japanese soil. They were strange and exotic. But what really caught the attention of the Japanese were the guns that they carried. The samurai understood immediately that guns threatened their very existence. Their forefathers always had known who they killed and who defeated them. With guns, how could they prove their valor to their lord? How could he reward courage? Even lowly merchants and peasants could fight with these cowardly weapons. Tradition soon gave way to technology. Many swordsmiths became gunsmiths. Soon Japan was actually manufacturing better and a larger amount of guns than any European country. Guns, along with professional military organization, finally ended the age of total war. Three great generals each contributed in his own way to a unified Japan. The first of these unifiers, Oda Nobunaga, who was born a peasant, eagerly took advantage of the superior supply of gunpowder available in his province. With his fearsome musket regiment, Nobunaga led an attack on Takeda Shingen, to whose son his own daughter was betrothed. Such were the times. Facing Nobunaga's troops in the field were the mounted samurai of Takeda, the cream of Japan's warrior elite, proud inheritors of the Minamoto classical tradition, a tradition that left them no choice but to attack. Nobunaga's musketeers moved to the front lines, a place of honor traditionally reserved for the best swordsmen. The Takeda cavalry charged down the hill. Only to be met with the deafening roar of 3,000 guns firing at once. While one rank fired, two reloaded. This was the first time that this devastating strategy, called rolling volley fire, had been used in world history. When the smoke cleared, 10,000 Takeda samurai lay dead on the field. Japan would never be the same. For all of its lethal beauty, its noble tradition, and the incredible skill required to wield it, the sword, even in the hands of the most courageous samurai, could not compete with a bullet fired from a gun in the hands of an uncultured peasant soldier. In the 16th century, on the strength of his guns, Nobunaga began to unify Japan's warring samurai clans. But at the height of his power, the ruthless and brutal Nobunaga was assassinated by one of his own generals. His death was avenged by Toyotomi Hideyoshi, his clever lieutenant, who laid the head of Nobunaga's killer on the grave of his slain commander. Hideyoshi was not just a brilliant soldier. He was also a shrewd judge of human nature, a master of diplomacy and compromise. Skills which he exercised on rival warlords in a portable tea ceremony room with which he traveled. He soon became the unrivaled master of all Japan. In 
In 1588, Hideyoshi instigated the Great Sword Hunt. He collected guns and swords from all the peasants and melted them down to make an enormous bell and a giant statue of the Buddha. The statue is gone. All that remains of it is this piece of the Buddha's nose. But the enormous bell, famous throughout Japan, is still here. The tolling of this great bell signaled the end of social mobility in Japan. From this time forward, one had to be born a samurai to wear the sword. Never again would a peasant rise up to usurp power as Hideyoshi himself had done. Hideyoshi's next project was to build a formidable castle at Osaka, designed to guard his legacy. And his ambition did not stop there. Hideyoshi decided he wanted to rule an empire. To him, there was only one thing bigger than Japan, and that was China. The invasion did not go well. Meanwhile, the third unifier, Ieyasu Tokugawa, a powerful lord who traced his ancestry back to the first shogun Yoritomo, pulled back to his own provinces during Hideyoshi's invasion of China and bided his time, strengthening his position. After Hideyoshi's death, Tokugawa had the largest standing army in Japan. Hideyoshi had made Tokugawa swear to be loyal to his heir, an oath that Tokugawa broke when he attacked the heir's forces at Osaka Castle. Despite its massive walls, the castle was no match for Tokugawa's superior siege guns and cannon. Tokugawa, in his turn, became lord of all Japan. The last and greatest of the three generals had finally brought the bloody civil wars to an end. Once in absolute power and control, Tokugawa refashioned Japan into his ideal of an inflexible and rigidly structured society. He expelled foreigners, forbade Japanese to travel abroad, and amazingly, he outlawed all guns. Japan went back to the sword. But in this unprecedented time of peace, the samurai no longer had a reason to use their swords. There were no more battles, and the Tokugawa government outlawed sword duels and vendettas among the samurai. Domestic peace had a serious eroding effect on the warrior ideal Tokugawa tried to instill into his samurai. They ate, drank, played games, and dreamt of glory in times gone by. The samurai were able to take solace in the law that required them to wear the daisho, a two-sword combination. This set of swords served as a distinctive badge that indicated their privileged social status but these swords were mostly symbolic. Almost anyone of high rank began wearing them to denote their status, such as sumo wrestlers. In this long age of peace, the production of swords came almost to a standstill, whereas the creation of mountings and fittings for swords became a prosperous business. Precious metals were used to create extremely elaborate decorations for swords, like these gold inlaid guards, Small pieces of metal were attached to the sword's hilt under the silk wrapping to create a firm grip. These were called minuke. 